Welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank you uh, for joining us this afternoon um, on behalf of the Haddon Historical Society. This is our second program uh, in a series uh, which we're calling the Scoville Ho Ledger Series, and which is being presented by Linda May Peck, who is a Higginum uh, native. And her family has been in town for many, many generations. Uh, a number of her descendants uh, did actually work for D&H Scoville. And uh, Linda May has very generously volunteered to um, pretty much go through these um, boxes and boxes of Scoville ledgers that we um, were very fortunate enough to get from the um, American Precision Museum up in Vermont about maybe two years ago, and literally going through them page by page. So she's doing fabulous research. She's coming up with phenomenal, um, you know, history of the uh, D&H Scoville Company, and so she's doing her second um, program for us, uh, focusing this one on the early years of D&H Scoville. So without further ado, I'm just going to hand it over to her. But please feel free to go up and ask her questions and um, learn more about her family's fascinating history, because it really, she's related to everyone. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, she does have a, a really neat history. Um, so I'm just going to turn it over to her. And thank you so much, Linda May, for doing this fabulous research. And we really appreciate it. And you're on. Well, the brothers Daniel and Hezekiah Scoville, Jr. started D&H Scoville. Started D&H Scoville in 1844. Daniel was 29, Hezekiah was 24. They ran the company together until Daniel died in 1881. Daniel is the man to the far right of the photo. Hezekiah is the man by the horse's head. And the man two to the right of Hezekiah in the suit is my great-grandfather, Orlando Burr. And he'll pop up at times during this talk. This is the style of hoe that was commonly available in the South in 1844. It was termed an English hoe because all the hoes were imported from England, or a neck hoe because of this piece. This is, this is the style of hoe that the Scoville brothers manufactured. It was termed an eye hoe for this piece, which is where the handle was inserted. My previous talk focused on one year of company history, December 1889 to December 1890. At that time, the brothers shipped hose to 13 states. They went to Maryland, North and South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida on the East Coast, then uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas on the Gulf Coast, and into the interior to Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, and Missouri. And in that 12-month period, the company shipped 353,894 hoes. So that was D&H Scoville after 46 years in business. For this talk, I'm, I looked at the earliest available records to learn what the company was like in the beginning. Next slide, please. So the first book I looked at was Hezekiah Scoville's personal ledger book. And very conveniently, on the first page of that, he listed all the dividends he received from D&H Scoville between 1850 and 1879. Now these are just uh, Hezekiah's dividends. Daniel received an equal amount. So you multiply these entries by two to get what the total dividend the company paid in a given year was. Now the $150 in, uh, as a dividend in 1850 doesn't seem like much today. So I looked at what uh, the employees were earning then. Uh, many of them were paid by the month at 15 to $17 a month. So for them, $150 was nine to 10 months of income. Others were paid by the day, a dollar to a dollar and a quarter. So for them, $150 would have been five to six months of income. 
So that $150 was not as skimpy as it might seem. The last dividend recorded in the book is $6,000 uh, for 1879. Um, to get a sense of how significant that was, I wanted to look at Orlando's uh, salary. He was the company bookkeeper. He joined the company after graduating from business college in Poughkeepsie. He was working for the company at least by 1869 because I'd seen a letter in the company records for that period that he had signed, although I don't know how early he started. So he had a, you know, 10 years experience as um, a bookkeeper with the company. Unfortunately, the, there isn't a payroll record that corresponds with 1879. So I had to go with what Orlando's salary was in 1884, five years later, when he might actually have gotten a raise or two between 79 and 84. In 84, his salary as bookkeeper, the third person in the office with the two brothers, was $1,200 a year. So Hezekiah's dividend in 79 of $6,000 was equal to five years of Orlando's salary as bookkeeper. Let's see. Um, next one, please. So the next volume I looked at was Hezekiah Scoville's seniors. Uh, only existing accounts book for his business. Uh, this is Hezekiah Sr. on the first page, his, Hezekiah Sr.'s signature on the first page, and um, that is quite a fantastic graphic he added to it. I practiced a lot trying to come up with that, and it's not easy, and he just swirled it out in ink, you know, without any practice. I was already familiar with Hezekiah Sr. There's information of, about him in the biographical account of his son Hezekiah that's included in Beer's commemorative biographical record of Middlesex County, Connecticut, that was published in 1903. I plan to just take a quick look at Hezekiah Sr.'s book and then move on to D.N.H. Scoville records. But what I found is that there are discrepancies between the biographical sketch, which is sort of the Bible on the, the development of the, the Scoville Company, and Hezekiah's accounts that are relevant to D.N.H. Scoville's early years, which is why I'm now going to introduce you to Hezekiah Sr. Next one, please. So this is um, the information from Beer's book. Um, can everybody read that, or would anybody like me to read it? Okay. The main points are that Hezekiah Sr. Uh, began as a blacksmith, and he made hoes, hammers, chains, and caulking irons. So with that in mind, when I began working, working through his accounts book, I wasn't surprised to find entries for the sale of hammers, axes, and hoes. His customers for hammers had a choice of iron or steel and large or small. And the prices ranged from $4.50 a dozen for large steel hammers down to $3 a dozen for small iron ones. His last sale of hammers was in 1838. Between 1835, which was the start of his accounts book, in 1838, he sold 16,387 hammers. I next um, looked at the axes that Hezekiah sold beginning in 1835. They cost a dollar or a dollar 25 each, and between 35 and 46, when he made the last sale, he sold 2,510 regular axes. And there were some broad axes in there, a post axe, and some hatchets even. And what was interesting is that although there were some large sales of axes um, to uh, several dozen at a time, there were a lot that were just a single axe being sold. 
So you can imagine that, especially as those occurred in the autumn, that somebody was getting ready to work in a woodlot that winter and realized that they needed another ax and for whatever reason, and so made their way out to Candlewood Hill to Hezekiah's shop and purchased an ax from him. Uh, I believe that all these hoes, excuse me, all these axes and hammers that are recorded as sales in Hezekiah's book, Hezekiah Sr.'s book, were sold from inventory because I can't find any entry in this book that would uh, cover anyone actually making those items in the period 1835 to the last sale of um, axes in 1846. But the hoes are a different matter. Hezekiah Sr. was manufacturing hoes at least as late as 1839. And he was even selling hoes in 1844, the year his son started D.H. Scoville. Just as with the single sale of an ax, there were many single sales of a hoe, but they occurred in the spring. Similarly, someone deciding he needed a new hoe before planting season, so he'd buy one from Hezekiah. That wasn't possible in 1890, um, then um, the minimum sale that D.H. Scoville would make would be a barrel of hose, which would be 20 to 22 dozen, depending on the size. So that points out the difference between what was a local provider of what was necessary in the community to the big business that was really geared toward meeting the needs of the high demand for good hose in the South. And Hezekiah Sr.'s total hose sales in that 35 to 44 period um, was 2,992 hose. Next one, please. So this is a, another excerpt from the Beers account. And this introduces uh, that Hezekiah Sr. became known to Eli Whitney, the, the cotton gin inventor, and that Hezekiah went to um, New Haven, spent time with Eli Whitney, learned how to manufacture gun barrels, then returned to Candlewood Hill and began manufacturing gun barrels for Whitney. What this account doesn't state is when Hezekiah Sr. actually began making gun barrels. So um, what I did was to call the Eli Whitney Museum and ask. Unfortunately, they don't have a compilation of who provided gun barrows to the armory. They also don't have Eli Whitney's records. Those are held at Yale. And uh, there are microfiche copies available that anybody could look at, but I didn't pursue it to find out when, assuming it's in there somewhere, when Hezekiah Sr. first began making gun barrows. What I can say is that he was already making them by 1825 because that's when Eli Whitney died. Now Hezekiah's um, records refer to welding gun barrels. Two people provided me with information on manufacturing gun barrels at that time. Tom Hines, who was a referral from the Eli Whitney Museum, and Robert Gordon, who is an authority on iron technology in America from colonial to um, colonial time to 1900, and who also co-authored a report for this on the Springfield, Massachusetts Armory for the National Park Service. And what they provided was the, um, the information that an iron plate called a scalp would have been heated, then shaped around a tube to go from being something flat to something that was curved like this, a cylinder, and that was the gun barrel. And that they would most likely, the actual forming into the cylinder would have been done using a trip hammer to apply the force to change the shape. But then the join where the edges came up and met would most likely have been closed or welded using hand hammering instead of uh, a machine. According to an 1883 publication of the Department of the Interior titled Firearms Manufacturer 1880, 
When barrows were only being forged by hand, it required two people to work on one gun barrel, and six barrels a day was a fair day's work. Once trip hammers were introduced that were water powered, and the water power would raise the weight up that would then be tripped or released and come down and apply the impact to the, the scalp and work it into the shape of the, the mandrel it was being formed around. Then uh, 14 to 16 barrels could be welded a day and it only required one person working on each barrel. Next one, please. So these are the men who made Hezekiah Sr.'s gun barrels. Asher Burr, Ruel Knowles, and Michael Hubbard. And these are the types of gun barrels that Hezekiah Sr. made. Muskets, carbines, rifles, and pistols. The, um, what's interesting is once you start adding up all the barrels that were made in Hezekiah Sr.'s shops over the period 1835, again, the start of the only available book on his business to 1839 when Hezekiah Sr. died. It's um, almost 22,000 musket barrels, a uh, little over 8,000 carbine ones, over 16,000 rifle ones, and 29,000 pistol pairs. So you have to multiply that by two to get over 60,000, um, almost 60,000 pistol barrels were produced out at the end of Candlewood Hill. Uh, what's also significant in looking at the dates that these men made the barrels is that there are only two men working in the shop at a time. Asher Burr was already working for Hezekiah Sr. in 1860, uh, 1835 at the start of this account book. Um, and he continued to work for Hezekiah in making gun barrels until 41. Rule Knowles started making gun barrels in 39. He continued into 48. So from 39 to um, 41, Asher and he overlapped. But in, Asher wasn't making gun barrels in 42, but Michael Hubbard had started in that year. So then from 42 to 48, it was Michael and Rule overlapping. So again, it's only two people at a time producing all these barrels. What I have listed in red is the number of gun barrels sold in that period. Uh, it's not surprising that there's not a complete match in quantity of welded and sold because um, some of the barrel, well, there'd be a lag between when a barrel was welded or made and when it was probably sold. So there would have been barrels that were welded in the period before the start of this accounts book and so were listed in the prior period, but those barrels were then sold in the time frame of this accounts book. So that can account for why um, you know, about 2,000 more were, of the pistol pairs were sold than there is a record of being produced. The same reasoning applies to the rifles and the carbines. But when you look at the muskets, that's um, almost $10,000, 10,000 <laughs> barrel discrepancy between sold and, um, and welded. Um, some of that is that there were three other people who very briefly and in very small quantity made gun barrels in the period 35 to 38. They were Philander Burr, Atwood Scoville, and just somebody listed as W. Scoville. Uh, so that, they would account for about 1,500 barrels of that 10,000 barrel discrepancy. So what I think is a possibility is that there was a second person working in the shop that went in the early years shown for Asher Burr, and that person was Hezekiah Sr. himself. It would explain why there can be so many barrels avail musket barrels available to be sold that we can't account for um, when or how they were, well, when or who made them. 
And then in the bottom row, there's a list of the percentage of the total barrows welded that were um, welded after 1844. And this will become significant later on. But you'll see for the rifled ones, it's 41%. And for the pistol pairs, it's almost 50%. Next one, please. So who bought Hezekiah Sr.'s gun barrels? His accounts book lists 25 different accounts by name. What I've listed here are five gun manufacturers in Middletown who bought his barrels, and three purchasers associated with the Whitney Armory, um, actually in Hamden, but I called it New Haven. Uh, I didn't realize that there are so many gun manufacturers in Middletown. There may even have been others. Of the uh, 25 accounts, um, I could not actually pin down by doing internet searches uh, if some of the purchasers were buying for a gun company and it was just the purchaser's name who was used by Hezekiah or even where um, whoever it was that the purchase was being made for was located. So again, there could be more in Middletown than just the five I've listed. Henry Aston for pistols, Robert Johnson for muskets and pistols, James North, who I think um, was followed in the manufacture of gun barrows by North and Savage, a, a relative, because if you look at the dates, uh, these were both, both these accounts were for the purchase of carbines, and by the dates, uh, North and Savage followed on to James North in buying the barrels. And then EWN Star buying muskets and rifles for 39 through 44. In, and I'll point out, just the next time you're in Middletown, if you're stopped at the traffic light at the corner of Newfield Street and Washington Street, that gray house that never actually looks that nice, it's a Wesleyan house, maybe used for students, that's Henry Aston's house. So, um, in New Haven, P and E W Blake were buying muskets in 35 to 37. E W Blake is Eli Whitney Blake. These two were brothers, they were Eli Whitney, the inventor's nephews, and they managed the Whitney Armory from the time of Eli Whitney's death in 25 uh, until 36. Then trustees took over. Henry W. Edwards was one of the trustees who managed the company from the armory from 36 until Eli Whitney's son returned to take over the business. And the son is the Eli Whitney listed at the bottom. He graduated from Princeton in 42 and returned and took over and um, made a great success uh, beyond what his father had even accomplished with the Whitney Armory. Um, now a digression, next one please. Uh, and the, all this business about um, pistol or gun barrels is not a digression. I made a point of making sure Lisa would publicize that this was going to include the manufacturing of gun barrels. So you may be thinking, where are the hose? We'll get to the hose. But all this gun barrel stuff <coughs> becomes very relevant in the early years of D&H Scoville. Okay, but here's the real digression. Uh, Hezekiah Sr. sometimes paid uh, Asher, Rule, and Michael with food and goods uh, instead of cash. Uh, I'm, I'm certain that wasn't because Hezekiah Sr. didn't have the cash to pay them what he owed them for their labor and the manufacturing of the barrels, because he had a, a lot of money coming in regularly from the purchasers of the gun barrels. Instead, I think it was just a, a mutually satisfactory arrangement where Hezekiah Sr. had a farm as well as his shops, his forging shops. And so he had items that 
his, the three employees wanted to have, needed to have, that they would be buying from somewhere. So rather than buy it from someone else, um, they accepted these goods as part of the remuneration that Hezekiah Sr. provided. So it's um, three to seven and a half cents for a pound of beef in Hignum in the 1830s and uh, 1840s. Butter, 12 and a half to 22 cents a pound. Coal, seven to eight cents a bushel. Flour, five to $10.40 a barrel. Hay, six to $10 a ton. 40 to 60 cents for molasses per gallon. Two to three and a half cents for a pine board by foot. Six and a half to 14 cents for a pound of pork. 20 to 50 cents for a bushel of potatoes. 58 to 75 cents for a bushel of salt. Shad were not obviously something that Hezekiah was raising on his farm or getting out of his woodlot. But I could imagine Hezekiah going into the shop and saying, I'm putting in an order for a shad. Do any of you want a shad? And um, turned out all three of them at various times said, yes, they wanted a shad. But it wasn't Hezekiah saying, um, I will buy you a shad, compliments of Hezekiah Sr. It was Hezekiah then debiting what he owed his employees by the cost of the shad he provided to them. Uh, sugar, seven to 10 cents a pound. Turnips, 25 to 33 cents a bushel. And veal, four to seven cents a pound. It was interesting that so many prices had a half cent in them. And that, um, so I was, got in the habit of trying to see who paid the extra half cent if when the price was finally calculated out, it came to 39 and a half cents. Did the seller pay it, absorb it, or did the buyer have to pay 40 cents? And it, somehow it turned out that every time I went to check on it, there would be two transactions that were being paid for at the same time, and each one had a dangling half cent, so it came out to a whole cent. Right. Um, there's... Um, a lot of that's unknown uh, with all the information I was able to extract from Hezekiah Sr.'s account about the manufacturing of the gun barrels. The major question is, did he sell finished gun barrels? He obviously sold welded gun barrels. There would not need to be any more heating of the gun barrel simply to shape it. But there's more involved to having a finished gun barrel than just welding it. Um, Tom Hines provided this information. Uh, needless to say, all this hammering, the shaping and then the welding closed, the join, makes for a rough looking barrel. A single gunsmith would hand finish the outside of the barrel by either grinding, filing, or lathe turning. A production shop, especially one that is making large amounts of the same barrel, could add a rolling mill to this list. Next, the barrel would have to be bored and rifled. That's if it was to be a rifle barrel. And rifled to the correct caliber so that a rifling machine would be needed. I would say that Hezekiah would have, would have had more than one rifling machine. So I would say he had forges, trip hammers, lathes, possibly a small rolling mill, boring and rifling machines. And the rifling machine is what would uh, carve the grooves in the interior of the barrel that would give this, impart the spin to the barrel, to the bullet as it moved down the barrel, making the rifle bullet more stable than a bullet coming out of a musket. And that was the um, improvement from rifling the barrels. So that's um, a lot of machinery that Tom Hines lists again for a shop that had two people working at it um, at most in a given year. And it also involves a lot of handling of the barrel when you get back to thinking about just how many there were. Next one, please. Um, so again, uh, the total welded, all those barrels had to be handled 
in order to do the welding of them. But then they were going to be handled again so many times to turn them into finished barrels, if that indeed is what Hezekiah provided to his customers. I'm, I tend to doubt that that's the case. It probably could be determined conclusively with the information in Hezekiah's books, his book, single book, except for the mystery of the nub. Uh, beginning in 1843, um, Hezekiah has entries uh, on nubbing rifle and pistol barrels. Uh, the muskets and the carbines were never <coughs> nubbed. So, and it's quite a few barrels that were nubbed. So I asked Tom Hines and Robert Gordon what it meant to nub a, a gun barrel, and they have no idea what the term means. So there's a process going on that was adding time in the uh, preparation of a gun barrel, getting it ready for the purchaser to take. That's an unknown and would be um, challenging in sorting out just what, at what stage Hezekiah turned over his gun barrels to his customers. Next one, please. So this is the final bit of information on Hezekiah Sr. And what's uh, significant is that it's claiming that Hezekiah Sr. Uh, discontinued the manufacture of gun barrels and having no further use for the forging shops, decided to hand them over to his sons, Daniel and Hezekiah, so that they might make hoes. This, and that's, that 1844 date is in the text. I didn't insert it. This was the beginning of the well-known firm of Dean H. Scoville. So to me, that saying, Hezekiah Sr. stopped making gun barrels in 1844. And that's what I reported in my previous talk. But I showed you in a couple of slides ago that 40 to 50% of the gun barrels, uh, not the muskets, but the rifles, carbines, and pistols that Hezekiah Sr. made in the 35 to 49 period were made after 1844. They were made 45 to 49. So it's not true that Hezekiah Sr. stopped making gun barrels in 44. Um, next one, please. Okay, so now I'm actually going to go on to D&H Scoville on a year-by-year -year basis. Um, this is what is known about D&H Scoville in 1844. There is no mention of the company in Hezekiah Sr.'s account book. The uh, earliest has a DNH Scoville day book, which gives sort of a, a running list of transactions day by day that Lisa has is number two, which begins in 1847. And I went through that one, which covered 47 into 50, and the next one, number three, which finished out 1850 and went into 1853. The earliest letter copying book that Lisa has is number two. The copying book would have facsimiles of all the documents that um, the company generated. Uh, so letters, um, invoices, which would, would have been very helpful because the invoice would have shown where hoes were being shipped. But it's um, only letter copying book number two that starts out the holdings of the Historical Society, and that dates from 1856. So neither in the company records nor in Hezekiah Sr.'s accounts book is there anything to be learned about the company in 44. Next one, please. In 45, there is information to be gained from Hezekiah Sr.'s book. Uh, under the heading D&H Scoville Jr., which is how he always referred to his son's company, uh, he, it shows that Hezekiah Sr. paid for German steel, borax, iron, fire brick, Lehigh coal, and freight and expenses for the shipping of that, those materials to Hignum. And those are the materials that his sons needed to make a hoe. So Hezekiah Sr was buying the materials his sons needed 
1845 and presumably providing them to him. Next one, please. Now, this is again from Hezekiah Sr.'s record for 1846. And this year, he paid for charcoal for his sons to use, but he also was making cash payments to his son's company. And that was because his sons, D&H Scoville Company, uh, well, D&H Scoville, which is always described as making um, hoes, and nothing but hoes, except for ramwards during the Civil War, but you know, for most of its existence, hoes and only hoes. D&H Scoville was working on, pist on pistol barrels and on rifle barrels. Again, we don't know what they were actually doing because nobody knows what nubbing a barrel means. But uh, the company nubbed more than 2,000 pairs of pistol barrels and more than 1,000 rifle barrels. Next one, please. Okay, now we have the earliest available information from the company records proper. Um, and, but it only covers four months, December, excuse me, September to December in 47. But in that four month period, the company sold 4,047 hoes. This is their third year of business and uh, they were up to um, more than 4,000 hoes being sold if they only, if they're selling 4,000 in just a third of the year. And remember back in, um, when I was describing Hezekiah Sr.'s sale of hoes, he had sold 3,000 hoes in 10 years. So it points out the difference in quantity going out from Candlewood Hill by this time. And I only know of one destination where some of these hoes went, and that was New Orleans. And um, for whatever reason, when who, uh, Daniel or Hezekiah was making the entry in the day book for the sale of one um, set of hoes, they happened to write down that they were going to New Orleans. Um, and what was also interesting in this year is that the purchases didn't include only the hose that we're accustomed to talking about this style hoe, which is actually referred to as a half bright because the plating only goes part way up the face. But the hoe sales included uh, rice, grubbing, sugar, weeding, and rice. Oh, I said that. Uh, bog. I, it was. Rice, grubbing, sugar, weeding, and bog hoes. And uh, no description of what the difference in weight or size or even configuration is of those different types of hoes. By the time we get to 1890, it's only this type of hoe that's being sold, not the others. Um, you notice that um, is I listed Joseph Spencer as grinding hoes. In the D&H Scoville uh, day books, there are lots of entries for payments to men, there's always men, for labor. But there isn't always an annotation indicating what the labor actually was. <laughs> what you'll see in the subsequent slides is that I only include people who were uh, assuredly working on hose, um, not, uh, not anyone whose um, role and what he was being paid for isn't known. Uh, so um, again, we have uh, Hezekiah Sr. paying the company to uh, use the company's forge to draw out nub iron, that's the heating a bar of nub iron, and uh, drawing is actually the shaping of it, and to drawing scalps. And again, the scalp is the flat plate um, formed from what was originally an iron bar that's used to be um, hammered into being the, the tube that's a gun barrel. And also cutting scalps. And carbine, carbine uh, barrels are short 
um, rifle barrels and pistols, being handguns, are obviously the shortest barrels that uh, Hezekiah Sr. produced. So it makes sense that if there was a standard length for most of Hezekiah's machining or um, forging of barrels, the ones that had to be finished at a shorter length would have been cut. And that's what this reflects. Uh, next one, please. So now we're into 1848. This is the first full year of Dean H. Scoville records. And there are 7,506 hoes that were sold this year. Uh, Joseph Spencer's grinding hoes, Savannah Skinner is polishing them. W. Scoville is carting them, probably to Middletown. In 1890, he would have been carting them to the Hignam Railroad Station, where they, packed in barrels, would have been put on the Valley Railroad to go to Saybrook Point. There they would have been transferred to the Hartford boat, which was the informal name for the Hartford and uh, New York Transportation Company. And the Hartford boat would have taken the barrels to whichever pier in New York City would have connected with the railroad or the steamship that would have then taken the barrel of hose south. So the buyer had to provide the handles? Yes. Uh, Hezekiah explained in one of the, his um, letters in the 1889-90 period that often in the south you could obtain a good handle cheaper than he could get a handle here. So it was to the customer's advantage. And it made shipping the holes easier because again, they were packed in barrels. Um, but um, the Valley Railroad wasn't operating at this time. So um, again, W. Scoville was probably carting these to Middletown, but he could also have been um, carting to Durham. Alvin Bailey uh, lay, uh, worked on a dam. I'm assuming that was the dam that Hezekiah Sr. had put in to um, provide water power for his shops. Friend Dickinson made repairs at the lower shop. I include that because I don't think there's a good understanding of all the buildings that Hezekiah Sr. had. So that when there was any reference to one, I, um, I wanted to get it down on record. So here's a lower shop that has to be accounted for. Then there are purchases that D and H Scoville made, what the, the brothers made. And um, the indication from buying 75,000 hard bricks and 10,000 soft bricks is that the brothers were going to be making their own shop building out of brick. And they were along the way acquiring bellows from Eli Whitney toward that. Next one, please. So again in Fort, yes? What's the difference between a half break and a full break of oh, I understand from the looks of it, but right, well, what the use? Um, I don't know why the, anybody wanted a full bright one because it, uh, bright hoes were 50 cents more a dozen than half bright ones. And by the sales, 99% of the sales were the half bright ones. So why bright ones were even being made and why anybody wanted them, I have no explanation for. But because, uh, so what I think it is that at the time, what would be a plating all the way up meant that more of the face of the hoe had to be prepared to accept the plating. And that's why it costs more for somebody to grind or, or do any of the steps for a full, what was called a bright hoe. Um, so Hezekiah Sr. was paid for one day of Michael's labor. This is the Michael who normally made gun barrows and uh, for 50 cents to be reimbursed for the use of Hezekiah's forge to roll whole eyes. And again, this is the whole eye. And um, 
but Hezekiah Sr. was paying D.N.H. Scoville to, to again to draw nub iron, to draw scalps, and to cut scalps. Next one, please. Okay, so this is 1849, uh, 11,632 holes or so. This is a 50% increase over the previous year. Uh, Joseph Spencer was grinding hose. Savannah Skinner was blacking and polishing them. David Brainerd was trimming them. Russell Bailey was carrying them to Middletown. We know specifically where they were going. Uh, A. Bailey was opening hoe eyes. And Bella Burr was making a water wheel for $475. So I think this is the water wheel that was going to provide power to the brothers' new shop that they were making out of the 85,000 bricks they were buying, they bought the previous year. And that these 45 windows and the six doors were going to go in that new shop. Next one, please. And again, Hezekiah Sr. is being paid for the use of his forge to uh, do eye hose, and um, he was paying uh, his son's company on the books to draw the nub iron. And we still don't know what purpose the nub iron served, because we don't know what nubbing a rifle barrel, or nubbing a barrel meant. Um, Henry Aston bought 697 pistol pairs near the end of this year. Hezekiah Sr. died this year. Uh, any pistol sales that occurred while he was alive were recorded in his accounts book. This sale of pistols happened after his death, so it was wrapped up in the accounts of the D&H Scoville Company, not Hezekiah Sr.'s records. Uh, next one, please. This is 1850. This year, 23,297 hoes were sold. This is a 100% increase over 1849. The only destination I know for those hoes, um, and it would only be a small portion of them, was New Orleans. Uh, Joseph Spencer's tempering hoes, Walcott Bailey's grinding them, Henry Smith is opening hoe eyes. Uh, the brothers bought a trip hammer, and again, that does, applies the impact to something that's heated and you're trying to shape it. From Canfield and Robbins for $40, but it cost them $8.50 for the round trip to go and collect the uh, trip hammer from Salisbury. They um, also were buying anvils, um, one from Pettibone and Clark. What's really interesting is the uh, what the the brothers paid for insurance. Uh, on the shop, which I assume is this new brick shop that's been built over the past two years, the insurance was $91. Yet on Hezekiah, and I'm assuming the house and barns were Hezekiah Sr.'s buildings, um, for the house and barns it was only $3.67. Next one, please. So Henry Ashton, Ashton um, bought more than 4,000 pistol pairs from the brothers in this year. Um, it could have been that uh, the brothers decided to manufacture uh, a few, few, a few thousand uh, pistol barrels because they had uh, leftover gun iron from what Hezekiah Sr. had stockpiled. Gun iron and hoe iron were two completely different products, and they wouldn't have used the gun iron to make hoes. So rather than have it go to waste, could have said, we can make uh, the pistols, pistol barrels until we use up um, our father's stockpile of gun iron. Um, or they could have been thinking, well, um, there's uh, a contract that we should just take uh, out uh, a little bit longer. For whatever reason, in 1850, the year after Hezekiah Sr. Um, died, the brothers, who only ever made hoes, were <coughs> making gun barrels, um, 4,000 pistol barrels um, times two, so 8,000. 
Uh, this is the year of the first dividend, DNH Scoville dividend that you saw early on for a total of $300. This is also the year that the brothers received their first dividends from the ship Marathon. I'm not clear from the entries whether uh, Hezekiah Sr. had invested in the Marathon, um, eventually owning a one-eighth share, and his sons, after his death, bought that share from Hezekiah's estate, or Hezekiah loaned his sons so they could buy the one-eighth share, and they were now able to pay back Hezekiah, so they paid it into his estate. Whatever, there is a one-eighth share of the ship Marathon, which this year was now fitted out to be seagoing at a cost of $344.69, but that provided $800 in dividends to DNH Scoville. And thinking, that, remembering that this, theirs was a one-eighth share, that meant the Marathon's dividends that year totaled um, $6,400, which puts the D&H dividend you know, to shame. That's a piddling $300. Next one, please. So now we're into 1851. There are 23,172 20, 3, hoes sold this year, which is essentially the same as the previous year. So that nice progression of 50 or 100% increase year to year didn't fall, follow on in this year for some reason. Again, the only destination noted was New Orleans. Um, no, sorry, I didn't have a destination for this. Uh, Henry D. Smith was opening Ho Eyes. Walcott Bailey was grinding them, as was William Bailey. And then Richard and Orson Bailey were plating them. Uh, there's note that the company bought land of Sylvester Scoville for purposes of flowing for $355. I think this was so that the brothers could control who had use, who drew water from the Candlewood Brook. As, as they were expanding, um, they needed to be able to have an assured access to that water. But what was interesting was the next entry in the D&H Scoville day book following the, um, you know, the straightforward statement that they bought uh, the land of Sylvester Scoville for purposes of flowing. And that entry is for $1,000. And it's, um, there's, I think there's some emotion in this entry. Paid Sylvester Scoville excess over and above what his land was really worth. <laughs> so, uh, next one, please. This shows that um, the brothers are still manufacturing pistol barrels. So this isn't you know, using up Hezekiah Sr.'s gun ore because the brothers are also buying gun ore on their own account and using it to continue to make uh, the barrels. But it's only pistol barrels, not any of the long barrels. Well, now the DNH Scoville dividend is $2,000, $1,000 to each brother. But that's still not catching up to the marathon dividends in that year, because that's about $1,000 that the brothers received, which means the total dividends paid out by the marathon, the ship marathon to its owners would have been $8,000. Next one, please. Just a quick question on this one. The last couple of slides I mentioned 1,500 or 500 condemns coming back. Uh, Were yes. they particularly bad making these or uh, compared to their father or their father just never? No, nope, um, there were some <laughs> condemned or rejected ones that were noted with um, Hezekiah Sr., but not as many. Not as many coming, as, not as many or not, and certainly not as many every year or quite frequently. But it turns out <coughs> that um, it's not really a problem if you're a gun barrel is condemned or rejected. Because if it was a gun barrel that was produced for a government contract, and this was, again, information from Tom Hines, um, it, the gun barrel might be rejected if it was a quarter inch too short. It didn't meet government specs. 
but if the um, but otherwise it'd be a perfectly serviceable gun barrel. So there were gun manufacturers who were glad to buy the rejected gun barrels. So they could often get them at a lower price, as you'll see. And you know, there was no worry. They, the barrels weren't going to explode or anything like that. Question? Question? The uh, Marathon, uh, was, was that ship taking their hose down to New Orleans, or was it in some other kind of business, or we don't know? No, it was an investment. So it, um, I have no reason to believe that it was using their hose, that it was carrying their hose. It might have ended up, but it was, um, there's no obvious connection. Nothing states. Do we have any idea where it was made, like it was made in Adam or Higginham or something? Um, the, the one, the previous one, I guess, if you can go back to it, it gives the, um, one more, maybe, one more, sorry. Okay, HS and C. Tyler were the people who, the shipbuilders. And it may have been in, in East Haddam, because there was one mention, um, entry in the book about um, something to do with Marathon and East Haddam. So if, if that, they may have been a shipbuilder across the river. Now if we go back to where we're here. Okay, so um, we're in 1852 now. Uh, Wesley Knowles is, and John Grant and John Graves are opening hoes. William ba Bailey's grinding them. Hezekiah Brainerd's polishing them, as is Orneal Smith. And Asher Burr is plating them. And I don't know if this is the same Asher Burr who up until, well, through 41, was making gun barrels for Hezekiah Sr. Next one, please. Uh, I included this um, massive purchase of 20 cents for, trim it for two screws because, again, th there's always uncertainty about just what machinery was in any of the Scoville shops. Hezekiah Sr. and D&H Scoville. And here is a clear indication that they had at least one trimming machine. The next entry is interesting. Um, Hezekiah was uh, reimbursed $355, $335 for his expenses in traveling in the South. Um, I assume you know, trying to get more customers compared to $12.50 for a round trip to New York, which may have been involved with um, helping to arrange how the hose would actually be transported, uh, making rain, uh, establishing relationships with shipping companies. But anyway, um, at, according to Beer's account, it was Daniel who traveled in the South uh, prior to starting the company. Daniel, who um, met with the planters, Daniel, who was aware of the inadequacy of this type of hoe, and so who returned to Connecticut and um, convinced Hezekiah to join him in making this type of hoe. Uh, it was interesting that the town of Haddam paid D&H Scoville to do work on the highway, highways unspecified, Again, if this were 1890 and um, hose were going to the uh, Hignam station to go south and iron and steel and grindstones were arriving at the Hignam station and going out Candlewood Hill to the factories, I'd have said the highway was Candlewood Hill and it was simply taking a beating with all this heavy freight on it. Um, but again, the, this wasn't when the Valley Railroad was in existence. Uh, I included the quote on Dickinson and Company, um, because again, it points out some of the machinery the Scovilles had, uh, running uh, well, a lathe polishing wheel, and also a building, the Red Shop. Uh, Henry Aston bought 901 pistol pairs so again, the brothers are definitely manufacturing pistol barrels. And Marathon uh, provided a dividend of $625. Next one, please. So this is the last year I have information for from the two day books I went through. 
It uh, covers January to September in 53. There are 14,960 hose sold in this nine month period. Uh, Norris Bailey was, and John Graves and Oliver C. Neff were opening hose eyes. Uh, the significance of Oliver C. Neff is that in 30 years, his daughter, Clara Elizabeth, marries Orlando Burr. So he is my great-great-grandfather. Uh, William Bailey was grinding hose, Jonathan Treadwell was filing them, and Orson Bailey was plating them. And Bella Burr was building another water wheel. But next one, please. In this case, it wasn't for a new uh, building. It seemed to be uh, to replace one as Brainerd and Paddock were paid to take out an existing water wheel and put in a, a water wheel. So I assume it's the new one that Bella Burr just made. So here's an example of Asa Waters and company buying the refused pistol barrels. And you can see that um, it, they're very cheap when they've been refused, but there's um, nothing wrong with them. So uh, barrels that did not meet government specs for the, uh, for the federal government were often used to make firearms for the states or for private sales. And it, it was noted that Eli Whitney, the son, um, did a very good business that way. So here's the last DNH Scoville dividend I have information on. Um, it's $4,000. Now, if you multiply the marathon dividend by eight, you see DNH score will finally trumped marathon. And so it turns out that yes, investing in hose was a better long-term idea than investing in a ship. Uh, especially uh, as the brothers also invested in the city of Hartford. That was the steamship that in 1876 ran into one of the stationary spans of the bridge across the Connecticut, connecting Middletown and Portland. It was damaged, it was put back into service, but um, be interesting to see just how uh, large its dividends are. Oh, next one, please. So here's a summary of the growth of the company in the first 10 years based on the sale of hose. Again, you don't have a record for the earliest years, but you can see by 1852, which was the last full year of information I worked with, uh, the sales were already up to a tenth of what they were going to be in 1890. That's pretty good for a startup company that's um, just in its first 10 years. And one more, please. Uh, last time, uh, last talk, I uh, needed to find a home for a piano that had been given to my mother by the Scoville family. And um, so I advertised it, and indeed it found a home. Now this, uh, if you can make it out, whether you call it, a, I'm not sure what you call it, if it's a couch without arms or back, or a day bed, this belonged to Orlando Burr's nephew, Dr. Noah Burr, who um, practiced medicine in Hignum. He had his medical office in his house, which is on Depot Road. And uh, I assume his patients could sit on that, but if he was between patients and he needed to refresh himself, uh, Dr. Noah took, no, took naps on this day bed. So if anybody is interested in this bit of Hignum history, please see me. So that's it. Um, I did warn that there would be information on gun barrels. There was a lot of information on gun barrels. But the point is, there was a lot of merging of activity of Hezekiah Sr. with his business and D&H Scoville uh, for many years. Hezekiah did not go out of business when his sons started their business. And there's also the fact that the brothers uh, conclusively manufactured gun barrels, and they're never given credit for that. So, so thank you. I don't know. I think that's now we all have to go out and find guns.
that have been uh, <laughs> manufactured here in Higgin. I don't know. I, I have no yeah. idea. I have no idea. Are those guns? Oh, see, they did not manufacture guns here, oh, only the barrels. Yeah. And um, uh, often the markings on a gun will be, of uh, any firearm, will be those of the manufacturer who really assembled everything. So, um, but what you can do is uh, strain your eyes going through the microfiche records of the, the Whitney Armory in Sterling Library and find out, uh, certainly, uh, when... Hezekiah Sr. began providing gun barrels, and who else might have? You all have your marching orders. <laughs> so are there any questions for Linda May? We'll take a couple, and then you're more than welcome to come up and grill her personally. I saw Jack's on hand up first. Thank you, Jack. The opening slide, where is that building, if you, if you know? I don't know. Okay. I think that's um, probably one of their first ones that no, is no longer standing. I think that was farther out Campbellwood Hill Road, probably closer to Hezekiah Sr.'s home that's standing on the corner of Little City and um, Candlewood Hill, uh, but no longer, it no longer stands. Okay, so because Daniel is in the photo, this is before 1881 when he died. Okay, yes sir. Now you may have already said this, I was stuck on the other side of the East Half Bridge, so <laughs> I was like, uh, the, the buildings which are known now as the Scoville buildings, weren't actually manufactured or built by them. They were built by somebody else, like uh, 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 Higginham uh, Manufacturing Company or even Cutaway Arrow. Do you, do you have any information on that? Oh, no. Actually, the buildings that are known as Scoville Ho were built by the Scovilles. The, the buildings that were built by Cutaway Harrow no longer stand. Okay, because I got a picture that uh, looks like one. And in fact, there's the information in there uh, Since I, it's uh, cut away now. No, that 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 is pretty sure that was one of the Scoville Hall buildings. <coughs> and there's the information on uh, purchasing the bricks it's, and it's the on windows. The and the oh, well, it's on the internet. <laughs> 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 that uh, corner of uh, Wilson Road and Kenwood Hill. I'm sure that there's the fencing out there. Of most of yes. the gun barrels. Yes. Are those yes. Hezekiah's gun barrel, is any idea? Um, yes, uh, Hezekiah Seniors. Senior. Uh, uh, and in fact, um, Robert Gordon, well, he was actually my advisor at Yale. Uh, he, had, he had first heard of Hignum because he was tracking down the manufacturer of gun barrels and had heard that there was somebody in Hignum who um, had uh, made them. And that, that anecdotally, that there was a fence of them as well. So that is, yeah. the most fence post must be in the 1800s. Um, for Hezekiah Sr., they had to have been uh, before 1849, and especially because his sons, the Stephen H. Scoville, only manufactured pistol barrels, not any long barrels. Short yes. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I noticed when you list the states they were shipping hoes to, they were all southern slave homes states. I wondered why they never sold hoes to northern or midwestern states. Um, and part it was the demand, and um, you, I, I omitted something from my notes, uh, not intentionally. In 52, when it was the, that large number of hoes sold, over 34,000, uh, those hoes went to Jackson and Columbia in Tennessee, Louisville, Kentucky, Vicksburg, Mississippi, Cincinnati, Ohio, and other destinations. But it just happened that those far five destinations were noted in the, the accounts book. We had a talk, I don't know, a few years ago, uh, uh, Seth Brown, a professor, no, Seth Rockman, a professor at Brown, who did uh, extensive research on how the Scovilles did sell most of their um, early hoes to southern uh, cotton plantations. And um, you're absolutely right. And that was, they, that was you know, where they made most of their early money until the time of the Civil War. And that reminds me, I was um, sort of laughing at the 
uh, Scoville dividends as being less than um, the total Scoville dividend each time was, one was issued uh, being less than the total dividends of, uh, issued on the ship marathon. But um, the listing of dividends that Hezekiah received from D&H Scoville uh, actually totals $96,150. So over that period of 1850 to 1879, uh, that's how much he got in as dividends. Uh, Daniel got in a similar amount. And from what I see in their um, account books, the D&H Scoville books, uh, the company was not only covering all its expenses every year, even if it didn't issue a dividend in a given year, but it also was covering um, a lot of the personal expenses of the two brothers, a lot of the expenses of the their remaining siblings. Um, Hezekiah Sr. had 10 children. He outlived five of them. Uh, at his death, uh, three of his daughters, Fanny Porter, Hannah Scoville, Hannah Tyler, and Josephine Scoville were alive, as well as Hezekiah and Daniel. And it, it, uh, the, um, the daughters received um, some of Hezekiah Sr.'s investments but despite getting in really hefty dividends, which all passed through the, the D&H Scoville accounts, so they're there to be seen, um, the company was often reimbursing Daniel or Hezekiah for items they purchased for their sisters. In one case, Hezekiah purchased a book of Longfellow's poems for Josephine, five dollars. It came in on one entry, and on the other side of the page, he was reimbursed for that five dollars through the company. So it was um, well worth staying with hoes and not staying with shipping. So. All right. Well, thank you again, Linda. Bay. Thank you.